Seltzer was not printed by the mainstream press any longer, so he didn't have access to the larger community. What he did, though, was have access to a very important part of the journalistic community, of journalists who knew that there were flaws in the system. As a reporter, you knew what was going on, but you couldn't necessarily print it. So in their frustration, they would feed us. I had at least 200 newspaper men who at one time or another during the year would send me news. We had more real news items than we could use every week. In fact, often reported on the policies and actions of the federal government. This generated another very powerful audience. Scores of senators and representatives, three Supreme Court justices, and the First Lady all subscribed. Government insiders provided important leads. But in fact, Rich's material came from a government resource available to anyone. George spent a fair amount of time, as did I, just going through government reports because um, the stuff was all there. Congressional record, Food and Drug Administration, Federal Trade Commission. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those reports. But, you know, they're issued monthly. And they name companies by name. And when you read that XYZ company has been accused by the federal government of doing this and has been fined $10,000, uh, first you've got a reputable source, you've got the details, you've got nationally known companies, and nobody would ever print it. We had a monopoly on that kind of stuff. And it always evoked a great consumer response. Using these and other specialized but public resources, in fact, repeatedly uncovered news the mainstream press ignored. The stakes could be enormous, as with Infact's groundbreaking coverage of a nationwide pandemic that was killing over 100,000 Americans each year. Smoking shortens life. Between the ages of 30 and 60, 61% 60, more heavy smokers die than non-smokers. These facts from Johns Hopkins University constitute one of the most important stories in recent American history. But there is not a newspaper or magazine in America, outside scientific journals, which has published all the facts. I remember quite clearly his, his description of Johns Hopkins studies that seemed to show this correlation with tobacco. And my memory of the time is that although I believed nearly everything I read in Celtus as being accurate as far as it went and very conclusive, he seemed to have just a wild hair on this subject. Here was one where old George had to be uh, off his rocker a little bit. It, it couldn't be as bad as he said. In less than 25 years, the United States had become a nation of cigarette smokers. It began during World War I. Dispensed free to soldiers at the canteen, cigarettes were said to soothe the nerves and deaden the loneliness. America's cigarette consumption tripled during the Great War. And when the boys came home, the habit spread further. Once forbidden, Smoking by women came to represent the new social freedoms of the 1920s. Newspaper and magazine ads helped cigarette companies exploit their new market. With America's entry into World War II, cigarette companies jumped at the chance to expand even further. Overseas, cigarettes achieved a mythic status, a symbol of American abundance and style. home, George Seldes had a different point of view, and the facts to back it up. The latest Mayo Clinic report shows nicotine causes constriction of blood vessels. The habit of giving an injured soldier a cigarette may cause irreparable damage. Why won't you see this story in your daily newspaper? An army doctor writes us, I've seen the advertising contract tobacco companies make with newspapers and magazines. It provides that no news or adverse comments on the tobacco habit must ever be published. After the war, in fact, uncovered even more startling news. A doctor named Alton Oxner in uh, New Orleans uh, presented a paper at one of the medical uh, 
interventions linking cigarette smoking and, and lung cancer. It appeared nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And so we ran the text of uh, the thing. Lung cancer had been extremely rare before the rise of the cigarette industry. By the 1940s, it was fast becoming America's most common form of cancer. Seldes went after the story with a vengeance. He didn't do any, uh, any scientific discovery or anything of that kind. What George Seldes did was to focus on the failure of much of the press to report, and certainly to report adequately, the scientific findings that were being made as they were being made. That was George Seldes in the purest form saying the public needs to have all the information it should have to make intelligent decisions. But most Americans received little or no information from the nation's press. Instead, they were bombarded with cigarette ads that stood the scientific evidence on its head. The ads were so fraudulent, virtually the entire industry was cited for false advertising. In fact, covered that story too, while newspapers and magazines instead carried yet more cigarette ads. With little critical news coverage, more and younger Americans took up the habit, a story covered by In Fact and the mainstream press, but with vastly different perspectives. Then, in December 1952, Reader's Digest, which carried no advertising, published a two-page article. It contained the same information that had appeared in medical journals and, in fact, for years. But Reader's Digest was the largest selling magazine in America. Response to the article showed how public awareness and action could be affected by the press. The following year, cigarette sales in America declined for the first time since the Great Depression. But these changes were short-lived. In the decades that followed, press coverage consistently put tobacco company claims on equal footing with scientific evidence. As consumption climbed, cigarette-related deaths reached 200, then 300, then 400,000 Americans a year before the press took notice. And with cigarette commercials banned from television in the 1970s, print media were again the industry's main outlet for advertising. It was billions. It was one or two billions a year on advertising. Imagine tobacco spending two billion dollars a year. What effect it had on newspapers. Today, as yet another generation gets hooked in increasing numbers, journalists face the question George Seldes asked over 50 years ago. How can they justify more promotion than news of a product that, when used as directed, kills its consumer?